a lot of times I think what we do in the ecosystem, and I sure appreciate all the speakers that have gone before me and talked about ecology, uh, is we, we go into these ecosystems and we start taking Jenga pieces out. And so when we first came to the plains in 1895, maybe, we, uh, we, we took out the, the grassland. We plowed that out and started farming it. So we took a few pieces of that out for, for the perennials. This is hard to do when you're uh, in the spotlight. So we took, we took those out, and, and so then, let's say we, we plowed, so we took some, some more pieces out, you know, we maybe killed off some of those soil organisms. By plowing, and then maybe we added some uh, synthetic fertilizer, and that took some more pieces out of that ecosystem. And we're getting to have a pretty delicate balance out there. And so then, you know, we, we put in some more pesticides and, and uh, take out some beneficial organisms that are out there, maybe beneficial insects. And, and before you know it, the whole system collapses. And so that's how I like to think about ecology. And of course, Willie said the unintended consequences, and that's what we do a lot of times with our management of what we've done. We had a functioning system out here that produced hundreds of pounds of biomass and hundreds of pounds of animal meat protein without any fertilizer input, without any irrigation input. And we came in and we monkeyed with that system and, and we collapsed it, or we may be near collapsing it, or you know, we may be a hundred years from collapsing it, but sooner or later, if we take out enough pieces, then we've collapsed that system and we need to rebuild it. And it's gonna take time, it won't be quick. Uh, obviously, farming the way we have for a hundred years and we hear about regenerative ag, we're not gonna regenerate it just overnight. It'll take some time. So Charles Kellogg said there can be no soil without life and no life without soil. They evolve together. And, and I definitely was not trained that way. I was trained in reductionist science, soil science undergraduate, uh, master's degree in agronomy. And I knew everything there was to know about pouring something out of a jug or a bag and inputs and machinery and, and input agriculture and I had zero ecology classes. I wish I could take a class in ecology now or, or maybe get a degree in that. But And I contend, everybody recognize what this picture is in the corner? Don't recognize that? You know what that is? I contend that a lot of our agriculture systems are a whole lot more like the moon than they are what an agro ecosystem should be. Yes, I know they're not the same, but if we're gonna look at a spectrum from one end to the other of healthy and functional to lacking in biology, then a lot of our systems are, are more like the moon. And easily, it's easy that we got there. It's, it's easy for me to figure out when I think about how do we get there. If you look at the ideal soil, only 5% of the composition of an ideal soil is organic. So biology and, and worms and microbes and bacteria and fungi and dead organic matter, that's, that's the smallest fraction of everything that we're managing besides physical properties and water and air. So it, it's easy to maybe ignore that little fraction and say, it, it's, you know, it's no big deal. And that's what we've done for years and years. And if we had a stool, a three-legged stool and you took all of the biology out, you can still sit on this stool with two legs. And we've done that for a long, long time. Since synthetic inputs came about after World War II, we've balanced on a two-legged stool and we can do that a long time as long as we are willing to prop ourselves up on that two-legged stool. 
But in reality, this, this biology is super, super important. Instead of being a side chain over here, it should be the center of everything that happens, plant, animal, soil, human, microorganisms. And so often we think, again, like I said, I was trained as a reductionist science scientist, and so we look at one thing at a time. What does adding phosphorus fertilizer do to yield? What does adding this herbicide or not do to yield? But in reality, ecosystems function in holes, and, and all of these are interconnected like a big ball of, of string. And, and everything over here is in, interconnected. And so that has to change our mindset. And so we've all seen this, and the founder of the Noble Foundation, Lloyd Noble, he saw the Dust Bowl of the Dirty Thirties, and he wanted to do something to give back. And so I still see this today, but this is what really drives me. I'm in a wetter area than y'all are here, and, and I just hate to see dirty water going down the ditch. I live not far from Lake Texoma, and it is so dirty, I do not like to swim in it. And, and we've got a lot of room to improve. Mississippi River, a lot of dirt going down that river. And, you know, we've, again, we've got a lot of room to improve. So a little bit about me. I, I started on my journey about 10 years ago, consulting with a producer who had organic goals. And so we, we will work with anyone uh, based on their goals. It's not my goal, it's, it's the producer's goal, the landowner's goal, the farmer's goal to help him meet his goals. And so I started looking at, okay, how can we do what he wants to do without synthetic inputs? And what I found looking at old ag books, pre-1940, Ag books, yearbook of agriculture, uh, college textbooks in agriculture. I found a lot of the things that we're talking about now with soil health. My granddad was doing two generations ago. He may not have known why it worked or how it worked or even cared, but what they did worked. And so I've, I've had good mentors at the right time to learn from, and, and there were a few aha moments for me. One of the aha moments, I was at a, an HMI school, Holistic Management. Kurt Gadzia was teaching it, and he said, how many of you have a 2,4-D deficiency in your pastures? Anybody here have a 2,4-D deficiency in your pasture? Have you ever taken a test and it said 2,4-D is low, need to add some? And so that was an aha moment. So why am I spraying these weeds, weeds, am I 2,4-D deficient? And, and then you get into the definition of, in, of insanity and I'm spraying weeds every year and I've still got the same weeds every year. So what's going on? You know, are we treating symptoms or are we treating causes? Is the reason that there's a weed because we only have one grazing animal and it's a beef cow and everything the beef cow doesn't eat becomes a weed? Is it because we're trying to grow a monoculture of wheat and so everything in the field that's not wheat becomes a weed? And so then learning about ecology as, as I've gone along. And so here's, here's just some locations of folks that I work with. Here's Ardmore right here, south central Oklahoma, 100 miles north of Dallas. Yes, we get a lot more rain there than y'all get here. But, but I've worked with folks all over. I've worked with folks up around uh, Garden City, Kansas. Uh, this guy's down around uh, Graham, Texas. And the principles that I'm gonna talk about are the same. No matter where you are and no matter what you're trying to raise, the principles are the same. The practices and how you put those together will vary, but the principles are the same. So I wanna talk about what is soil health? How do you implement it? some success stories, the principles of soil health, some answers that I often uh, get questions about, and so some answers maybe to head those off. And so what is soil health? Willie put up a definition, and I'm gonna show the same definition. He had color on his, but it's the same words. Continued capacity to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And I don't have any problem with sustains, but an ecosystem, so I think, okay, what's an ecosystem? 
So it includes all of the living things in an area interacting with each other and with the non-living things. So the weather, the soil, the climate, the atmosphere, the geology, the topography, the elevation. And so use that to frame everything else that you think about. You have to think about what is the ecosystem that your farm resides in. And your farm ecosystem is different than Gabe Brown's farm ecosystem. Three keys to soil health, know your environment. So these are all the answers right here. If there's a quiz, write these down because these are the answers. Apply principles, not practices. Tools, cover crops are a tool. Fertilizers are a tool. Biological stimulants are a tool. Fire is a tool. All of those are amoral. They're neither good or bad. A chainsaw is not good or bad. A gun is not good or bad. They are just tools that we can use. And then it's not one size fits all. I like to say it's like a puzzle with no picture on the front of the box. And so you have to figure out how you put those pieces together. We've seen this picture before today. Here we've got the uh, annual precip here in the panhandle and you can follow that all the way up and down. And we've all seen that before, but what I really like to compare that to is the pan evaporation. And so there is nowhere else like this area in the United States. Nowhere else will you get the same amount of precip and evaporation that we get here anywhere else in the U.S. There will be people that say, oh, I do this and I get way less rain than y'all get. Yeah, but you get a third the evaporation that happens down here. So that environment is very, very important to think about. Think about your environment. Think about how your soil is covered, how it could be covered. How was it covered before white settlers ever got here? Think about how intense or frequent was large scale disturbance before white settlers got here. How intense and frequent is large scale disturbance on your farm today? How intense and frequent could it be? How could you manipulate that? What's the plant diversity like? And what could it be? How many crops could you put in your rotation potentially? If markets weren't an issue, if markets weren't an issue, how many different crops could you potentially grow here? I don't know the answer to that. It's something you have to think about though. When and how are roots growing? If we came here 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, again, before white settlement, I would contend that there would be warm season plants with roots growing in the summer, cool season plants with roots growing in the winter. They might grow slowly in the winter, especially today, very slowly, but there would have been living roots out there actively growing, slowly but active. And then finally, what animals are present or could be? There were obviously animals here once upon a time. They maybe didn't reside here all year long, but they probably passed through. And so what can we do on our farms to pass animals through those fields. And it's not one size fits all. Everybody has different needs and different resources. So water, we've talked a little bit about water. I know it rains more where I work mostly, most of my time than it does here, but how much do you get in the soil? I don't care how much it rains if you can't get it in the soil. How much can you hold in the soil? Do you have a plow pan at 10 inches that water doesn't infiltrate? Or do you have a four foot profile of soil that you can capture water in and hold? And then can you keep it from evaporating? So those are my three keys to water. I don't care how much it rains. I really don't. I don't care how much irrigation water you have. What matters is, how much can you get in the ground? How much can you hold in the ground? And how much can you keep in the ground? So here's one of those success stories. 
this was on Jimmy Emmons farm in the summer and he had a cover crop and he said, oh, we need to leave a check out there. So we removed all of the cover crop from that check. And it was bare and it was hot and it was dry in the summer of 15 in Leedy, Oklahoma. And I, there, there's some pictures of uh, what soil temperature, soil surface temperature could be in the shade of a cover crop and what soil surface temperature could be on bare soil in the summer. I like my steak cooked at about 135 degrees. I like it pretty rare. 135 kills the microbes at 122. I think we're killing microbes that could be doing beneficial things for us in the soil. So I was back out in that field the following spring and I said, Jimmy, look at that square. Can you see that on that slide? I can see it because I know I'm standing in the middle of it, but that square was still there. We'd had cover crop terminated late in the summer. It didn't go to maturity. He terminated it. Planted his wheat, normal fall wheat planting time, had a, had a good fall, had plenty of moisture. And you could still see that square the following spring. And so we pulled some deep soil cores. I, I probed around a little bit with my soil probe while I was out there. And we heard somebody earlier talk about where that dry soil layer was. So in that bare ground, that dry layer was at 16 inch deep. We only had water 16 inches where the bare soil was. We had moisture 33 inches deep right next to it in the cover crop. Same soil, same management, same rainfall, just no cover. I'd call that a pretty big success. Didn't matter how much it rained, it rained the same on both sides. And so then we, we measured how much, how much moisture does that equilibrate to? If you look at the depth of the moisture, well, how many inches of moisture is that? That's about three inches of different amount of rain. How much would three inches more irrigation or three inches more rain make a difference in your operation, especially if it came at just the right time? That's money in the bank right there. So we've got to keep that moisture in the ground. And Jimmy and I used to talk about how, well, you can see the rainfall coming down and you can see a plant out there. And yes, plants use moisture. We know plants use moisture. We can't really see them using moisture, but we know they're using moisture. We know we're evaporating moisture. We can either transpire water through a plant or we can evaporate water from the soil surface. And it's really hard to see, but uh, Russ Jackson captured this picture. This is clean till, both sides clean till. It's not no till, it's not a trick picture, but one side had a wheat cover crop on it and one side was bare. And you can see that moisture coming off the bare ground. That's something we seldom see, but it's happening all day, every day, moisture is leaving the soil surface. So fallow is a tool. I'm not saying fallow is good or bad. Fallow is a tool, but are you keeping that moisture in the soil if you're fallowing? Are you really? I'm going to say probably not as much as you think, and it's probably not that much more moisture than, uh, than a cover crop would use. I'm going to say they're probably pretty, pretty similar. And then you start thinking about all the things that cover crop is doing for feeding those soil microbes. And then, then you start getting into that exponential where one plus two doesn't equal three, one plus two starts to equal nine. Famous picture, again, Russ Jackson, we call him Mr. Infiltration. This field actually slopes away. It slopes off into the horizon. There's a creek just beyond the horizon there. And that's the direction of slope on the field. And I've had people say, well, the, the field slopes from right to left. And so that's why it looks all wet right there is that's just the natural slope. It's not. This is the difference that cover crops, grazing, no-till, proper fertility management, crop rotation makes in the soil on this side versus heavy tillage, continuous wheat. No grazing on the other side. And there's another date and another picture. And so why does Russ's soil take water? Well, we 
we don't have to look very hard. Just dig a shovel full up and it's full of wormholes. It's full of biology. It's full of those aggregates with the pores that moisture can soak into and it takes it up just like a sponge. And so I do some math. This is theoretical. But if you want to do the math and, and we're quite confident that his neighbor has a plow pan at about eight to ten inches. And so if he's working off the amount of moisture he can capture in that top 10 inches, he's got about two inches of water he can capture. That two inches of water at the average transpiration, evaporation uh, measurement, ET, gives him 13 days of water. Anytime he's got a full 10 inches of soil, he's got 13 days of water. And we've watched over the years and that's about how long he can go without a rain, the neighbor. Russ, we've taken deep cores and measured. We've found pores and worm channels down at the four foot depth very, very easily and very, very evident. And so now I talked about how much water can you hold in the ground instead of holding the top 10 inches worth of water, he's holding 48 inches or more of water in his soil profile. And so he's got six to 10 inches of water storage in his soil profile and he can go two months and, and he did, he has, I've seen it, uh, between rains and, and still have excellent yields. It's, it's not that he has poor yields. He's beating the county averages, beating the neighbors. And it's not that he's putting extra inputs on it either. He actually, his CPA called him last year and said, I think you must have forgot to send some receipts in because you're about $15,000 short this year on this field compared to what you were last year on inputs. Start adding that up and you get into real money. So no-till alone, not saying no-till is good or bad, but no-till alone as a tool to get water in the ground doesn't work. And you'll hear, you'll hear university extension experts say, well, no-till is not any better than clean till. We can go ahead and use heavy tillage because no-till is not any better. And they're right. If you don't use it as part of a system, a system that includes rotation and cover crops and, and livestock. And so what we have here on the, my right, your left, is dirty water coming off of a continuous no-till field. And there's a little crop rotation, not a lot, a little, but it's been no-till for 20 years. And, and there's dirty water running off of that field. It runs on to another field of Shane O'Daniels, who has livestock, cover crops, rotation, good fertility management, and that water's then clean on my left, your right, when it leaves his field as it goes on downhill and downstream. So it's how you manage that as a system. And here it is again on this time on my left, your right, that's the no-till field uphill, the dirty water coming off and running onto Shane, and, and then it leaves clean when it leaves Shane's. Here's another example. An irrigated field could not put on more than a half an inch at a time. Half inch application with a pivot was all that field would take. And it barely took that shifted to crop rotation. It had already been no-till, but shifted, well, vertical tillage, is that no-till? Does vertical tillage count as no-till? It's kind of no-till. So shifted to full no-till, no disturbance, no vertical tillage, uh, cover crop. It had a decent crop rotation already because it was irrigated, but cover crop, grazing, full no-till, and now it can take two inches of irrigation. And in this picture, they were applying two inches of irrigation and a two inch rain came through and there's no standing water. So they went from barely being able to take a half an inch to taking over four inches. They've measured the infiltration rate at six and a half inches an hour. When it rains out here, does it come hard and fast? It, 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 and is it getting harder and faster, seems like, when it does come more extreme? The rainfall events are getting more extreme. I think we've got data that backs that up. They're, uh, they're always gentle out here. Well, at your place, Arian. 
And so, so again, if your soil can only take in a half an inch, it doesn't matter if it rains six inches, but if your soil can take in six and a half inches, how much of that can you get in the ground? How much of it can you hold in the ground? And how much of it can you keep in the ground? And so this is, this is just another picture of that field. So folks are being successful at this. We've heard some excellent farmer speakers today of success right here locally that this works. Applying these principles in a system does work. I mentioned to RN out here at lunchtime, there's a wheel. When you all leave, look at the wheel over here along the wall. It's carved out of wood. Looks like it was carved out of a chunk of tree trunk. It's about this big around. And I bet when that guy was carving that wheel out, I can just imagine somebody walking by and saying, that'll never work. You're, you're investing too much input into doing that. We've never used a wheel before. This is the way we've always done it. But once that guy had his investment in time and labor into making that wheel, how much did that change his system? He had to invest in it. He had to invest time and input. But then it was for the better of his system later. And that's what we're seeing, that farmers are seeing all over the world. And it'll work here in Texas, just like it'll work in Australia, Argentina, Austria. So some common traits that these guys share. No-till, crop rotation, cover crops, livestock. They're all innovators, I believe. I would call them innovators. And they all have a peer network that they operate in. And, and those are just some common traits that I've seen in these folks that have been successful. So principles, again, principles. We apply principles, not practices. So I'm not gonna tell you what to do on your farm because that would be practices. But I will tell you, implement these principles. Think about these principles in everything that you do and how well is what you're doing match up with these principles. So mimic, don't fight nature. Keep the soil surface covered, armor that soil, protect that soil, it holds moisture in, it keeps the temperature more moderate, provides a habitat for beneficial insects and microbes, minimize unnatural soil disturbance and stress. And I will contend that putting out 100 pounds of gas to fertilize is an unnatural stress. We, we have to use fertilizer sometimes, but how can we maybe manage or manipulate the timing and the rate and the placement so that we're less stressful? We wanna minimize those stresses. Likewise, if your phosphorus level is only a two, that's a stress on that system. You might need to address that. And I put unnatural disturbance a piece of metal growing through the steel, again, it's amoral, but that's unnatural for a piece of metal to go through the ground. Now, a hoof to disturb the ground, that's pretty natural. A root to disturb the soil, natural. Worms tilling the soil for us, natural. Increase plant diversity. So we might do that with cover crops. We might do that with crop rotation. We might do that with uh, leaving strips. There are people putting prairie strips in through the middle of fields now. Uh, there are people that are putting uh, companion crops in with their crop. Increase plant diversity, maximize root growth. I'm not gonna say you have to have a root growing 365 days a year but I wanna think about how can we maximize the number of days we do have a growing root out there. And then properly integrate livestock diversity. So if we can add cattle, that's great, but how could we maybe stack enterprises? I understand it might not be easy, but how could we maybe stack cattle and sheep or cattle and goats or cattle and sheep and goats? And then are those weeds really weeds or do they become feed for those livestock. And yes, there were large ruminants here, pre-white settlement, but there were also probably smaller ruminants. There were non-ruminants, there were fowl. And so don't be content that to say, well, I've added livestock to my cropland. There's still another level I believe we can go to. 
Again, the principles are the same. How you apply them is what matters. I can't hardly believe that there's anywhere that you could say, I just don't have enough soil to make this work. This is solid rock. Solid rock. And Mother Nature, Mother Nature is going to cover bare soil. I, I said mimic Mother Nature. She's going to cover bare soil. Let's not fight her. Let's try to cover it with something that benefits us and her. But let's not fight her. So how can we do that? We can grow a crop. We can leave crop residue. We can grow a cover crop. We can manage our grazing so that it doesn't look like this stage when we're done and pull the cattle out. Minimize unnatural disturbances. No till. Keep it covered. Appropriate nutrient management. Because I'm going to say if we don't manage that properly, that's an unnatural disturbance. Manage our grazing. Control traffic. That may be another place where we could go to the next level by controlling our wheel traffic in our fields. Maximize root growth. Again, it's for you. You have to know your ecosystem. And every day of the year may not be what you can do, but how could you maximize and get as many days as possible? Grow healthy crops. The healthier the crop you grow, the, the more roots you're going to grow with it. Uh, crop rotations. I mentioned companion crops, cover crops. Maybe planting mixtures. Uh, soil fertility. A good soil fertility program goes a long way to growing healthy plants, which grows healthy roots. And then again, managing grazing. Anytime we take more than 50% of the above ground biomass or the leaves off of perennial grasses, whether they're introduced perennial grasses or native perennial grasses, anytime we take more than 50%, we stop the roots from growing. And depending on how much we take more than 50%, we'll determine how many days those roots will stay not growing, how soon they will start to grow again. And this work was done by F.J. Kreider in 1955. It was published. And I think it's probably one of the most overlooked pieces of research that was ever done. You might hear people say it takes grass to grow grass. And the reason is because anytime we take more than 50%, those roots stop. What does that do to your drought resiliency if you have one plant that the roots have stopped growing and a plant next to it that the roots continue to grow and grow deeper and bigger and larger? So manage that grazing. Increase plant diversity. How can we do that? Crop rotation. Maybe plant, maybe plant different varieties. That's a start. Uh, maybe you can even plant them at the same time. If we're planting wheat for grain, can we plant two different varieties of wheat in the same drill box at the same time? As long as maturity is similar enough, there's no reason we can't do that. So that's a start. Cover crops, companion crops, border strips, weeds. Weeds may add some plant diversity at no cost. Maybe we don't have to kill everything. Properly integrate livestock. So manage that grazing, look at multiple species of livestock. Maybe we graze our crop residues. Maybe we don't ever actually grow a feed crop, but maybe we graze behind the combine and, and clean up some residues. Maybe we turn a, a field into a feed ground for winter. Uh, maybe we don't have any animals at all, but we apply manures and we still get some benefit as if we had some livestock out there biologically from the manure and the, and the, the activity that that stimulates in the soil. So <clears throat> I'll take a little side turn. I, I presented this a couple years ago, diversity who needs it? Where to get it? Why does it matter? And I showed that with the Jenga game. And so here's some examples from history. The Irish potato famine. Two potato varieties. Both were susceptible. A million people starved or died of disease. No diversity in that. Zero diversity. Zero degrees of freedom. Southern corn leaf blight. Fast forward a little, little farther. 1970. Most of the corn germplasm was susceptible. Huge economic losses. Is that a billion? Billion dollars in crop losses in 1970 dollars. 
no diversity or not enough diversity. Roundup Ready. Have we seen issues with that? Roundup resistant weeds? When everything in our rotation is a Roundup Ready crop and there's no diversity in our herbicide program? I see it a lot in places I work. It may not be as common here. Uh, I liked one of the slides. I saw there were six different modes of action on that herbicide program and I like that. But what happens when we get herbicide as our only means of weed control. There's no diversity in weed control other than herbicide, even though it's different modes of action. And then what do we do when we have weeds with six different modes of resistance? So here's, here's man's way because it makes it easy. We live in a mechanized agriculture world and it makes it easy if we have one degree of diversity and not much, every, everything's uniform. Not much variability out there. We can plant it all at one time, spray it all at one time, harvest it all at one time. But here's Mother Nature's way. Hundreds of degrees of diversity and very little uniformity. If all you got's a hammer, everything looks like a nail, yeah. So what if you got a toolbox? You might not build a house with this toolbox, but you'll get more done than if all you have is a hammer. And so I equate this back to that ecological community. Think about the community where you live. If everybody in that community was a doctor, who's gonna haul your garbage? Who's going to uh, do your law documents? Who's gonna teach the kids? Who's gonna bake the bread? Doctors are great, nothing wrong with doctors. But what if your community has garbage men and bakers and butchers and factory workers and people that bring food out to your house and people that work on tractors and all of those things that we need, which one's going to be the more functional, beneficial community for all of us to live together in? So the FAO, Food and Ag Organization, says that healthy soils maintain a diverse community of soil organisms. And I say it's actually the other way around. A diverse community of soil organisms maintain healthy soil. So what can we do as managers, as land managers, to benefit these organisms so that they can do the work of keeping our soil healthy instead of us having to do it by buying inputs? So plant diversity, that's, that's one tool we can look at. Plant diversity increases microbial, soil microbial diversity. And so how can we, what, what do we need to look at? Warm season, cool season, grasses, broad leaves, legumes, non-legumes. Crops, could you grow all of these here? You may not have a market right here, but could you grow them? I'm going to say probably, probably. Here's a neat field of canola field with uh, clover planted between the rows. So they've added diversity. Here's some diversity in forages. These are both vetches, hairy vetch and woolly pod vetch. Diversity in when they mature. And so what does that do for beneficial insects? We see it in bees and butterflies on the flowers. But if you can see it in the bees and butterflies, what about all the other beneficial insects, the lacewings and the ladybugs that could be out there that can take care of pest problems for us? So maybe we need to plant something that looks like this. Maybe we need to grow something that looks like this. Here are, uh, here's some actual data. We grew individual plant species of cover crops and then we mixed every one of them together in a uniform combination. And uh, the F is fair, the P is poor, G is good. So the mix always outperformed uh, by visual rating, growth, robustness, vigor. Here's a different time frame. Here's another time frame. We're always outperforming in a mix. And again, it's that synergy of working together. Dr. Zach, I really wish I could take a whole semester of your classes. 
animals. So again, I mentioned we might have uh, we might have had buffalo here, and we might have beef cattle here, but there were a whole other uh, mix of animals that could have been here or could be here by stacking enterprises. And if you've ever listened to Gabe Brown, Gabe Brown, I think he's probably got just about all of these somewhere on his ranch. Insects. I like this. Jonathan Lundgren did this work in North Dakota in a cornfield. But insects are very diverse, and most of them by far are not pests. There's very, very few insect pests. Most of them are beneficial, or at least they don't do any damage to us. A lot of them are beneficial, they eat other pests. Some eat weed seeds and reduce weed populations. And so the way to increase insect diversity is by increasing plant diversity, and that decrease, decreases pests, pest pressure. And here was one in, in a field of mine. I had, uh, had sorghum in a cover crop mix. It was a diverse, I think we had 30 or 40 different species in this mix. And not far from it, quarter of a mile, another researcher there at Noble, this was on the headquarters farm, he had just Milo, a monoculture of Milo. We both got hit with sugarcane aphids. I took this picture of the, the underside of a leaf with all the sugarcane aphids on it. Probably should have treated. He definitely should have treated. He lost his Milo crop completely. I went back a week later and there were no sugarcane aphids left. The ladybugs and the ladybug larvae and all the other predators cleaned up my sugarcane aphid problem with no insecticide. But I had to provide that diversity, that plant diversity, to have the habitat for those beneficials to live in so that they could do that work for me. So why diversity? There's lots of reasons why. Maybe you can extend the grazing season. Maybe it offers you pest control. Maybe you can reduce some other, other uh, inputs by having diversity. Spread your risk. If you've got four crops growing out there and you have a total failure on one, aren't you glad that wasn't the only crop you had growing out there? Uh, erosion control, compaction breaking, nutrient scavenging. The more plant diversity you have, the more zones of nutrients, the more zones that those roots are exploring and, and capturing nutrients from and recycling those back to the, to the surface. Maybe it improves soil health, whatever that means and whatever that's worth. I like it for weather resilience, building in drought resistance, building in flood resistance. If you've got soil like Russ Jackson's got, like a sponge, you're way more resistant to a flood and way more resistant to a drought. And I think Paul gives us some good wisdom on diversity. If we were all hands, what good would that do the body? We need all of us in a community working together. Same thing in the plant and animal and soil microbe world. Okay, so these are some common questions that I get. Cover crop seed. Again, it's just a tool. I'm not here to sell cover crops. It's a tool. But if I'm going to use cover crops, what do I plant? Where do I get it? Uh, what soil health tests to do? We talk about soil health. Well, how do I measure soil health? Uh, how to manage grazing. That could be a whole semester class in college. And, and where to learn more. So, cover crops. These are some that have consistently worked for me, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, across the 100th meridian some. These consistently work. I'm not saying make a mix of these, but these are ones that have consistently worked well for me. There's lots of other ones out there, and I'm not saying don't try them. There might be some that work great for you. And so seed sources, maybe you can raise your own. Maybe you've got a local source. Maybe you've got a neighbor that grows them. Maybe you can buy some from one of the many seed companies that's represented here. It's available out there. Soil health tests, there are lots of them. And if you did every one of them, it would probably cost as much as, as an acre of soil cost to buy and sell if you did every one of these soil tests. 
Some that I like are field soil health indicators, and we'll talk about those. A conventional soil test, I still would do a conventional soil test through a traditional lab, so we know what our organic matter and pH and CEC and NPK and all those are. And I personally really like the Haney test. There have been times when looking at a Haney test and looking in the field and looking at a conventional soil test has been like going from black and white TV to color TV of, oh, that's what's going on out there. It's the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Makes perfect sense now what I'm seeing in the field. So those are tests I like. Soil Health Institute has a whole list of just tier one indicators and, and now they've got tier two out and they're working on tier three. And again, it would take a lot of time and money to do all of these, but you see some of these main ones, pH, CEC, NPK, micronutrients, those are on a standard soil test. So go ahead and do a standard soil test and get those. Here's the Haney test. Everything Haney measures, I don't use because I don't know how to use it. I'm sure it means something to Dr. Haney. It's just a number to me. But, but things that are useful to me are his H3A extract and NPK, the additional N that he measures in that test. Standard tests only measure nitrate nitrogen. There's lots more forms of nitrogen out there in the soil. They're in flux all the time, and that's the main reason we don't measure them in a standard soil test, because they're in flux. And so by the time the crop's growing, that source may or may not still be available. Uh, CO2, water extractable carbon, C to N ratio is soil ca health calculation. The N release, the P saturation, and, and some of these ratios are useful to me. Oh man, that's a bunch. I'm not going to do it. It's great, but I'm not going to do it, especially not at the price they cost. But I can do this. This doesn't cost me anything but a little time with a shovel. And go out and look at color. I think we all intrinsically know that the darker the color of the soil is, the better it is. All other things being held equal. The structure. Is it massive? solid like a brick or is it nice and crumbly aggregated the biology do you see worms or can you dig all day and night and never find a night crawler the root resistance are we seeing resistance to penetration by roots and the smell and this was the hardest one for me to get a handle on was the smell a dead soil has no smell it's just no smell to it. Soil should have a, an aroma to it, a good aroma to it. And so start, start smelling your soil when you're out there. Just be sure nobody's looking. Do it while well, they can't see you. So here's some of that root resistance. You see these roots go down and go sideways. You see these layers of compaction from tillage all through the soil. So again, Look at color, look at structure, look at biology, look at root resistance and smell of it. You can, we can all do that. And the more you do it, do it in your field, do it in a neighbor's field, do it in your best field, do it in your worst field, do it over in the fence row that hasn't been disturbed in years and years and years and years. Grazing management, like I said, this could be a whole class. Intensity, frequency, duration, timing, rest, water, fence, carrying capacity, stocking rate, stock density. But I will tell you, one cow for 30 days is not the same as 30 cows for one day. It's all in how you manage it. Challenges. Yes, there are challenges. There's challenges with partners, bankers, landlords, chemical suppliers. There's challenges with the weather. There's challenges with resources, whether it's time or money or knowledge. Economics, there's a learning curve. Nutrient management becomes different when we manage our soils different. Pest management becomes different. I'm not saying you'll have more or less pests, but you'll have different pests than you had before. Government programs can be a challenge. But there's places to learn. Y'all are here today learning. There's, there's information all over the place, field days, mentors. I mentioned these success story guys, all of them work in a, in a peer group and use each other as mentors. Uh, practice, 
there's there's no uh, there's there's nothing that can compare to practice on your own. There's there's no replacement for practicing it on your own. Don't practice it on the whole farm all at once. Try a small area and get it figured out there. Uh, social media. There's a lot to sort through and figure out what's useful and what's not useful. I won't say good or bad, but useful and not useful. Social media agencies, NGOs like the Soil Health Institute and Noble Research Institute, No-Till on the Plains, No-Till Texas. Here's some groups that I follow and participate in on Facebook. Likewise, there's information on Twitter, there's information on Instagram. You may say, what in the world could you get good out of that? There's some nuggets out there. But the benefits, these are the benefits. These are why we do it. More water infiltration and storage. I, I would contend the producers that I work with, our most limiting nutrient is water. We've got sunshine, we can go buy minerals, we can buy genetics, but water we have very little control over. Or do we? We can't control when it comes or how fast it comes, but if we can control how much of it we get in the ground, how much of it we can store in the ground, and how long we can keep it in the ground, then we can start to make some positive changes. Reduce erosion. Increase nutrient cycling. Anybody know what this is? This was my BS meter. And the first time I heard some of these guys like Gabe Brown and Rick Bieber talk about what they were doing, my BS meter was off the, off the charts. But I've been to their places, and what they claim they're doing, they're doing. Now, they didn't go from full fertilizer to no fertilizer overnight. They've been in these systems for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. But now, yes, they're, they're raising record yields on nearly no fertilizer input. And so that's because of those nutrients cycling, the biology that's cycling and providing those nutrients. We can decrease soil temperature fluctuations by implementing these principles. And just one example that y'all may find out here, pigweed, amaranthus. Pigweed seeds are stimulated to germinate by fluctuations in temperature. And the more temperature fluctuation there is, the more it stimulates pigweed seeds to germinate. So the more we can moderate that soil temperature with cover, the less problem we will have with pigweeds germinating. We can decrease compaction, we can decrease pests. Here's another place to learn more. It's kind of hidden, but if you go to noble.org, up in the top right hand corner, there's a little bitty magnifying glass. And if you'll click on that and you can type in any topic you want to type in, cover crop, soil health, cattle genetics, uh, weed control in ponds, it will pull up all the resources we have on that. You can email me. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. You know, you said something about temper temperature fluctuations encouraging the germination of pigweeds and you know over the years when I was younger when we weren't growing a crop we went to great effort to keep things bare and fallow because we didn't want anything using up moisture and and you know any but you know you can you can spray chemicals you can spray enough chemicals to keep something fallow you can run sweeps through it and you can keep it fallow and on and on but I've always been amazed the longer something's fallow, you know, sometimes, you know, once you get that moisture, the harder it is to keep it fallow. And it almost seems like, you know, natural mechanisms in nature because you, you made the statement that you'll never see soils in nature that are uncovered or don't want to be covered. And I was hoping you might expound a little bit on that. Yeah, you remember the definition of insanity? Plowing to keep weeds out, <clears throat> and you get more weeds, so you plow to get those weeds out, and you get more weeds. That's the only way I can explain it, really. Uh, nature wants to be covered. You go anywhere that's undisturbed, you think of the boreal forest in northern Canada. You're not going to find bare ground there. It's covered. It's got plants growing. It's got animals out there. 
So I really liked what one of the speakers at No Till on the Plains said this year. He said, I consider myself the coach of a really good team and my job is just not to mess it up. Let the team go out and do what they know how to do and score points and win games and me just not mess it up. And I think sometimes that's maybe hard for us to do as land managers. We think I've got to do something. I've got to get on the tractor and run the sweeps. I've got to go spray. I've got to do this or that. <clears throat> how can we mimic nature and work with nature and let nature take over <clears throat> and, and maybe steer nature so that it benefits us and nature rather than fight against it. This is a little different. You're talking about diversity, adding livestock. I don't want any, I don't want to deal with the cows. Have you heard about arrangements that I let somebody bring their livestock on? What kind of financial arrangements or, you know, have you heard about ways to make that work? Yes. And so some of the challenges with that, a guy that has, let's just say cattle, he's probably not going to want to move them anywhere if he can't leave them there for at least 90 days. So we need to think about windows that we maybe have to bring, we'll just say cattle, in for 90 days. And, and, and how could we, you know, how can we do that? And maybe we supplement feed along with the crop residue that they're grazing. Maybe we plant a cover crop and let them graze the cover crop some until we get a minimum amount of residue that we want to leave because it's going to disappear fast. We want to leave a minimum, but you know, maybe we can graze some of it and get our cover crop benefit from it. Uh, financial arrangements range anywhere from just a set and you pay me this much an acre to bring cattle out here or this much a head a day or on the gain. I know people that do it all of those different ways. I know some people that do it for free just for the benefit and the, the livestock owner does all the care and he puts up the fence and checks the water. Uh, there are challenges with numbers. If you're farming a thousand acres, you may not have a guy that can put cattle on all thousand acres. But maybe you can do an 80 at a time and you do this 80 this year and another 80 this year and another 80 this year. And we see that a lot where guys don't try to do every acre at one time, but they, they focus on an area and move that around and work on it. So those are just two of the challenges and two of the ways we address it. Um, it it's great if you've got your own where you can, can have the flexibility to come and go as you please. But I understand that doesn't work everywhere. And that's never gonna work in the Midwest, in Illinois and Iowa and, and Indiana. And, and so those are some of the things that they're doing is they're just working on small areas at a time and focusing on those and improving those. Uh, like I said, manure is a great way. Maybe you don't ever have any livestock, but you can get manure from the feed yard and put out there and still get a benefit from that. Uh, flexibility is the key and, and maybe it's not maybe it's not beef cows maybe it's cool cows so you know they have different nutrition requirements than a, than a wet cow uh, 